Thank you, Thomas. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I haven't been to one of these meetings before, so I look forward to meeting a lot more people today and tomorrow, perhaps. Um, yeah, so I'd like to talk a little bit about what we've been doing recently with trying to use Jupyter Notebooks for teaching and for documenting the code, the Clawpack code that Thomas mentioned. Um, and in the process, say a little bit about reproducible research, although I'm going to focus sort of more on some of the teaching and documentation aspects. Um, so in addition to being in the Department of Applied Mathematics, I'm also uh, associated with the eScience Institute at the University of Washington. I wanted to say just a word about that. This is a, an interesting project that uh, has some major funding from the, the Moore and Sloan Foundations and the Washington Research Foundation uh, in the direction of data science. Uh, and in particular, there's a big grant called the uh, Data Science Environments Project uh, from the Moore and Sloan Foundations, which is joint between the University of Washington, NYU, and Berkeley. Um, and they asked the three universities to come together and put together a proposal. And it's interesting uh, because it's kind of focused not entirely on developing data science techniques, although that's part of it, but it's largely on sort of the environment in which data science is done. And the, the uh, foundations were in particular interested in issues of creating better career paths for people who are interested in developing tools uh, within academics rather than perhaps writing traditional scientific papers. So that's one of the big things that we're kind of concentrating on is how can we facilitate people who want to write good tools and do things that are very useful in science even if they don't result in traditional sorts of publications. Um, another big benefit of get, being involved in this project um, is that I've gotten to work with people at Berkeley and NYU including Fernando Perez and the IPython team there. Uh, they've been also happily involved in this project on, on that side. Um, one of the working groups that we have between uh, campuses is called Reproducibility and Open Science, which I've been heavily involved in, which is also focused on the whole issue of how do we uh, encourage people to publish the, the software or the algorithms at least, the, the computer code that goes along with publications uh, and make things more open in that way. So there's a lot of work going on in that direction as well, and I think that things like Jupyter Notebooks are a great platform for helping facilitate that. Okay, so just to say a bit more about myself, since you uh, may not be familiar with what I've, where I'm coming from, um, my background is in numerical analysis, scientific computing. I've been working for many years on developing methods for wave propagation problems, uh, so hyperbolic partial differential equations basically model all sorts of wave propagation. We're interested in particular nonlinear problems where shock waves can form, which makes it more difficult to solve numerically. Uh, you can't often use a standard finite difference method, so we use what are called finite volume methods um, that can do shock capturing. And for about 20 years now, we've been working on this CLAW pack uh, project, which stands for Conservation Laws Package, um, which has been applied in lots of different applications. And um, it's had adaptive mesh refinement in it from, the, from the early days, working with Marsha Berger at NYU in particular on that. I'll say a little bit more about that as we go along and also about GeoClaw, which is a, a variant of the code that we've been developing for the last 10 years or so. Uh, specifically, well, originally for tsunami modeling, it's been used also for storm surge and other sorts of overland flow, flooding and whatnot. So a lot of my time now is spent on tsunami modeling applications. And I, I want to say a little bit more about these methods and that application in particular because I want to use it as sort of a case study for some of the notebooks that I'll go through. Um, so I'm going to give you a crash course in solving hyperbolic partial differential equations. Um, bear with me. But um, So in one space dimension, a basic hyperbolic conservation law says that the time derivative of some conserved quantity or vector of conserved quantities, mass, momentum, energy, something like that, plus the x derivative of some flux function that depends on those variables is equal to zero. That's basically a statement of conservation of mass, for example. Um, in 2D, it's the divergence of some flux vector, f and g, say. And if you can differentiate that and get the Jacobian matrix times qx. And in the simplest linear case, that would reduce to, say, qt plus a qx equals zero, where a would be a, a matrix. And the thing that makes this a hyperbolic equation is if this coefficient matrix a or the Jacobian in the nonlinear case or some linear combination of the Jacobians in the two-dimensional or three-dimensional case, if that's a, a matrix that can be diagonalized uh, with real eigenvalues, uh, in which case the eigenvalues tell you the wave speeds and the eigenvectors tell you something about the propagating waves and the relation between different components of Q and a propagating wave. So most wave propagation problems can be 
formulated as hyperbolic conservation laws one way or another. And there's lots of applications where these arise. Uh, in some cases, you have linear wave equations and acoustics or advection or elastic wave propagation and seismology or something. Uh, in some cases, you have nonlinear waves looking at, at uh, traffic jams arising in, in traffic flow, for example, or shallow water equations used to model tsunamis uh, or compressible gas dynamics. Um, and the sort of methods we use, since we're, we care about discontinuities in the solution and shock waves, we have to use these finite volume methods. And it turns out a very nice way to sort of look at nonlinear conservation laws or any hyperbolic equation is to study what's called the Riemann problem. So the Riemann problem consists of whatever equation you're looking at with just piecewise constant initial data, so a single jump discontinuity. Uh, and what happens as, as you let time evolve then is that from that single jump discontinuity, you get waves that propagate. And if you can understand the waves for that very simple case, you can use that both to understand the mathematical theory of nonlinear equations, but also to develop good numerical methods. So there's a class of methods called Godunov type finite volume methods. Godunov was working in the Soviet Union in the 50s and kind of developed the first method of this sort that's based on solving Riemann problems to, to develop um, solutions to more general initial data. So here's a Riemann problem for the acoustics equations, for example. Acoustics, linear acoustics in 1D, you have just two variables, pressure and velocity, say. Uh, so a Riemann problem would be like a, a shock tube problem would be a special case where you've got two or a gas at two different pressures and say zero velocity with a membrane separating them. You break the membrane. What happens? Well, it goes pop. What's that popping sound? Well, from this initial jump in pressure, you get two waves, two acoustic waves, one propagating to the right, one to the left at speeds plus or minus C. And if you write out the hyperbolic equation, these are the eigenvalues of that two by two matrix and the eigenvectors tell you what those waves are basically. Or if you look at it in the XT plane with time going upwards, from this initial discontinuity, you just get two waves propagating away. And if you look at these more complicated hyperbolic systems, you have exactly the same sort of structure. You might have more waves if you have a system of more equations, uh, but you can kind of represent the solution this way. So here's another example, a similar uh, initial condition, but this time for the nonlinear shallow water equations, which model conservation of mass and momentum in one space dimension here. Uh, and here the, the colors are just a tracer that's being advected with the flow so you can sort of visualize how the flow is moving. Uh, the simplest Riemann problem would be a dam break problem where there's zero velocity but a jump in the depth. And then you get something like the, the two waves in acoustics, except if you have a big enough jump, they behave in a nonlinear way. And what you get is a shock wave moving to the right uh, and what's called a rarefaction wave or an expansion fan moving to the left where the flow is being sort of uh, continuously accelerated uh, from the left and piling up here across a hydraulic jump moving to the right. So as time evolves, uh, you have this sort of self-similar solution that's just spreading outwards. And if you plot that in the XT plane, you see the shock wave as a discontinuity going at constant speed one way, this rarefaction fan, the, the fluid is being accelerated to the right, but this wave is moving to the left and the solution is constant along any one of those rays. Okay, okay so that's sort of a, a snapshot of how these Riemann problems are solved. Um, and then the numerical methods, I won't say much about them, but this, the original Godunov's method was to, to look at, again, in the space-time diagram at time Tn, say, we have cell averages, and it's a finite volume method, so we think of approximating the cell average of the conserved quantity, and then at the end of the time step, we get a new cell average by solving the Riemann problems for each of these discontinuities are, and then averaging the solution over the grid cell at the end of the time step. Okay, so that's the idea of a Riemann problem. Now, I've been figuring out or trying to figure out what's the best way to teach this material uh, to students for a long time. So in 1989, I think it was, I gave a course at ETH in Zurich and wrote up some notes that I thought I would turn into a book within a couple of years. Uh, it took me, uh, what, <laughs> 14 years. Eventually a book came out published by the local publisher here, Cambridge University Press, um, which ended up being 600 pages long or so because um, I kept teaching this class over and over again and thinking of more things I wanted to bring in and other things I wanted to do. Uh, and also in the process of this, we developed this uh, claw pack software, the conservation laws package, um, which was originally developed actually for one of the classes I was teaching as a way to kind of illustrate these methods better. Um, and one thing I liked about uh, the way this book came out was all of the figures, or almost all of the figures in the book that 
correspond to computations, had the code posted on a website uh, so you could use the claw pack code to sort of reproduce any of the figures in the book and play around with them, change the initial conditions or whatever. Um, I'd like to say that we've updated all those codes to the latest version of claw pack because claw pack has evolved quite a bit since then. Some of them have been updated and we have a sort of a gallery of those and a bunch of other examples. Um, they haven't all been updated and I kind of keep putting some of that off because I keep wanting to do it in a better way. And so recently we've started playing a lot more with Jupyter Notebooks and one of the things that we plan to do is update all of these examples to, to run in a notebook and make it much easier to play around with the examples. Um, so I, I imagine everyone here is familiar with Jupyter, but just in case you're not, it's, uh, it's the new name for the IPython notebooks. Uh, they've made the sort of platform more general so it's easier to use with, with Julia and R and other languages. Um, and <coughs> if you go to jupyter.org, you can try it out in the browser. Um, and it's very easy to install these days and get running on, on your laptop. I'll also talk about some cloud possibilities later on. Um, so one thing that I'm working on now is a, a, a new book on explaining Riemann solvers for various different problems where we're planning to have a, a small book that has some uh, examples in it, but each chapter about each separate Riemann solver will be accompanied by a, a notebook that the student can play around with things and actually uh, explore in a much more interactive way. So I've given many talks over the years where I've gone through sort of the slides I showed you, sort of statically looking at one particular example or maybe having an animation of one particular example. But I think you can teach much better if you can let the students actually play around with things. So I'm working with David Ketchison, a former student at Kaust and a current student, Maurizio Del Razzo at UW, and we're starting to develop some of these notebooks. We're still kind of playing around with what's the best way to, to do all of this. Uh, and again, we've also been using notebooks for more and more of the claw pack documentation and describing some of the, the Python tools that we've developed in particular, which I'll, I'll give a demo of in a minute. Um, I also, I forgot to put on here, but there's also a version of claw pack called PyClaw, which is more Python based. We use Python for sort of the IO interface for claw pack in general, but the main claw pack code, especially the adaptive mesh refinement is written in Fortran uh, using OpenMP. And then we use Python mainly as the interface. But for one-dimensional problems, it's nice to be able to play around with it directly in a notebook, for example. And so there's this PyClaw version that David Ketchison and Kyle Manley and Aaron Amadea and others have been developing that allows you to, to play around more easily with ClawPack. Oh, I also wanted to mention that uh, one thing we hope to do is kind of make these notebooks available on the web for people to, to use. Um, and there, there's an interesting project in this direction that O'Reilly has been pushing to sort of make a platform where you can actually run notebooks on the web on their server. Um, so I won't say too much about that, but if you're interested, you might take a look at, at this. So they have a, a system where you can, as you're reading through a book, you'll see a, a, a fragment of code with some examples, and then you can, um, there's slider bars, widgets here, but you can also go in and actually change the code and click on run again, and it will, will rerun it. Um, so what we're thinking about is, is primarily um, having notebooks that students could download and, and run on their own computer, but also have it in a way that you can at least view it in a browser with some of the widgets working and whatnot. Um, so I also wanted to mention uh, the work of Jake Vanderplas, uh, who's at UW, part of the eScience Institute now. I'm sure many people know Jake. I think he gave one of the keynote talks at, at SciPy in Austin this year. Um, but he's been doing a lot of interesting work in this direction. Uh, and in particular, he's got a couple little packages he put together that we've been using quite heavily. Uh, one is this uh, MPLD3, which allows you to do sort of static widgets where it pre-computes all of the solutions so that if you view a, a notebook through NB Viewer, you can still uh, use the widgets. I think they're working on putting that sort of thing directly into Jupyter notebooks, um, but as far as I know, it's not available yet. Um, and then JS Animation, uh, which I'll also demonstrate, which is just a way of taking a set of PNG files, for example, and turning them into an animation that can, can be viewed at, uh, in a notebook on the web. And Jake has a nice blog if you're interested. He talks about all sorts of other things as well as giving lots of examples of, of those codes. So let me uh, switch to doing a, a few examples in the notebooks. Um, I have a few examples on my web page of some of the things I'll go through today are, are there. Uh, I've been meaning to update some of those examples and pull in some new ones. I didn't get quite as much done this summer as I'd hoped to with too much travel, but uh, over the coming months, we'll be putting more things there. Um, so if you're interested, you can try some of, 
some of these things out there as well. So let me uh, just go through a couple of things here to give you a sort of idea of the sort of things we're looking at. Let me uh, try to get a little more real estate here. Okay, so this is uh, uh, one of the notebooks that uh, Maurizio has been working on. Whoops, what did I do? Maurizio has been working on to illustrate some of the ideas we've been playing around with for shallow water equations. Um, so, of course, one of the nice things about the notebook is that you can write mark markdown, including LaTeX, for mathematics expression. So, for a mathematician like me, that's really sort of essential if you want to be able to explain what's going on in a notebook. Um, and then I won't go through the code really here. But let me just show you that you can embed using this JS animation package. You can embed the sort of animation that goes along with the slides I showed you a moment ago. Um, and this is fully viewable through NB Viewer on the web um, with, the, with the animation and the slider. And you can um, slow it down or speed it up, do various other things with it. Um, so that's very handy. And then if the student actually has this notebook running on their own computer, and they wanted to try a different Riemann problem, maybe changing the left and right states, then they could go up here and change the values here, this HL, UL, HR, and UR are the, the depth and velocity on the two sides of the, the initial discontinuity. You could change those values here, uncomment this line, and if you re-execute this cell with different values, it would actually run claw pack in the background to solve this problem with the advection of this color tracer and produce a new animation in a matter of a few minutes. I won't try to do it right now, um, but that's the sort of thing that you can make it much more interactive for the students to play around with. Um, but you can do other things. So for example, here's another view of that same Riemann solution. Um, and here, so I, I mentioned that in the XT plane, we have this sort of shock wave moving to the right, rarefaction wave moving to the left, and here's what the solution looked like at one time. Um, Maurizio sort of used uh, some of the techniques from MPLD3 and, and wrote uh, this Riemann solver in JavaScript, actually, so that you can go in and move the slider bar here and see how the similarity solution changes as you move it. Um, but moreover, uh, the plot up here in the upper left shows what's called the phase plane, which is what we get if we plot the depth H versus HU, that should be an HU there. Um, so it's the one, one component of the vector of conserved quantities against the other. Uh, and so each point, for example, the left and right states correspond to points in this phase plane. So for this particular problem, Q left has a depth of six, Q right has a depth of two, as you can see here, and the velocity in both states is zero. And then as the solution evolves, you get this non-zero velocity in between. Um, <coughs> and the curves that are shown here are uh, what come out when you solve this nonlinear Riemann problem mathematically. There are formulas for how you connect the left and right states. There's a middle state, a constant state here in the middle that's the intersection of two curves, exactly which curves depends on whether they're shocks or rarefaction waves. It takes several weeks to go through kind of the, the mathematical theory of how you develop this sort of solution. But in the course of teaching that, it, it's, I always end up drawing a lot of these pictures on the whiteboard or using a lot of sort of static slides, but it's much easier are much nicer if the students can come in and sort of play around with this and see what happens if you move these states in the phase plane. So for example, this was a case where the depth was higher to the left than to the right and the velocity was zero everywhere. What if I switch those states and put the higher state on the right and the lower state on the left? Well, then we'd expect the same sort of picture but now with the shock wave going to the left and a rarefaction wave going to the right. So we could do that here by just taking the state and dragging it over here, for example. Maybe drag this one over here a ways. And now we have a deeper state on the right than on the left, and it's recomputed sort of on the fly as we move these, what the resulting shock wave and rarefaction wave solution are in this case. And then you can move these things around and see how uh, shock waves turn into rarefaction waves, vice versa, depending on where these states are. So this gives a tool, by the way, if you want to try this out yourself, there's a URL down at the bottom. Uh, it should work uh, through NB Viewer if you, if you want to just pull up this web page and fiddle around with it yourself. So this is the kind of tool that we're trying to develop now for illustrating a lot of these Riemann solvers, and I think it, it's 
a much nicer way to sort of explain what's going on. Let's see. Um, so one thing we've been working on a lot, I mentioned, is, is tsunami modeling. So I thought I'd show you one sort of example of the kind of simulation that we do. Um, this, by the way, is uh, the sort of output that comes from ClawPack. Typically, when you run the plotting package, it, it creates a bunch of PNG files. You can, of course, run it interactively in IPython. But if you, if you make a, a web page, it creates a set of um, web pages with individual PNG files, but also uses this JS animation to concatenate them all together into a movie, uh, similar to the one we were just looking at, that you can run on the web. So what this is showing, if we step through a little more slowly, this is the 2011 Tohoku uh, event on the coast of Japan uh, that was, of course, devastating in Japan. But that tsunami also propagated across the Pacific um, and uh, did hit the west coast of the US. Crescent City, which is marked here, maybe you can see, in particular, was badly damaged tens of thousands of dollars of damage in the harbor there from the tsunami, and one person killed on the beach near there um, from the tsunami when it arrived there. So we've been doing a lot of work with, with tsunami modeling. Uh, in, I live in Seattle, and there's a lot of concern about the Cascadia subduction zone just off coast that can have similar magnitude 9 earthquakes every few hundred years. So there's a lot of work going on now about sort of modeling potential tsunami impacts on the coast. So we use this sort of adaptive mesh refinement where we start out with a fairly coarse grid, and then as the waves arrive, we can make it arbitrarily fine. And I'll show some uh, results later where we actually zoom in on Crescent City to a very fine scale. So that's the sort of work that we're doing. Um, and we've been trying to facilitate uh, making it easier for people to use these tools in, if they want to apply GeoClaw to other tsunami modeling problems. So we have a lot of tools, Python tools, that we've developed um, for working with topography, bathymetry, the underwater topography, the big data sets that you need to work with there, and also for uh, the actual earthquake generating a tsunami. So we have a, a topo tools package that sort of helps you work with topography, and a detopo tools package for moving topography, um, such as uh, the seafloor deformation caused by an earthquake. So this is one of the notebooks that's on the, the ClawPack webpage. Um, what happened here? Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, there's this Cascadia subduction zone off the coast of, this is Seattle, Puget Sound, the west coast here. But just to sort of show you what a subduction zone looks like, so there's um, the ocean floor plate, the Juan de Fuca plate in this case, is subducting beneath the continental plate. And so it's constantly moving, except that it doesn't move very smoothly. It sticks, and tension builds up. And then every few hundred years, there's a big slip, and that's what causes the uplift of the seafloor, and well, the earthquake initially, but also the uplift of the seafloor. So the seafloor might be uh, several kilometers above where the slip is happening on this fault plane. Um, so the way that these earthquakes are represented um, is often as a, what's called a, a subfault file, uh, where you have a large fault zone split up into lots of little pieces. And on each piece, there's some geometric information about how it's oriented, what direction the slip is going in, how much slip there is. And then you have to read in all of those, and from those, construct what the resulting seafloor deformation is. So this, this particular notebook is just kind of illustrating how to use some of these tools to read in one of these files that has a bunch of subfaults at different latitude, longitude, depths, um, shapes, the strike, dip, rake, and, and slip are the parameters that sort of describe how the slip is happening on that particular fault. Um, let's see. So let me just quickly go through a couple of things here. So this is just sort of plotting the, the particular subfaults and the sort of green lines here show the direction that the slip is happening. So this would be kind of looking down at the Earth um, and what direction the slip is in. And then this is the magnitude of the slip on those. And then maybe I'll just, this was, oh, this was actually a uh, model of the 1964 Alaska earthquake uh, off the coast of Alaska here, showing where those faults are. Uh, and then you can also specify, in addition to a slip on each of those fault planes, you can also specify a rupture time and the time over which it slips, because often it's not, you know, it doesn't all move together. The rupture starts someplace and propagates out. And if you're looking at very long faults and long wavelength tsunamis being generated from them, the, the time history of the rupture can also be very important in what size tsunami it, 
it generates. So um, this is sort of the resulting seafloor deformation from that particular slip pattern or the final seafloor deformation where the, the red is where the seafloor has been uplifted, the blue is where it's subsided, and it's that sort of very large scale motion of the seafloor of, of in this case about 12 meters at most, um, which causes the tsunami uh, when it happens underwater. Um, and then you can also specify sort of the rupture times and end up getting, for example, this sort of movie of how an actual dynamic rupture might uh, progress along a fault and the resulting seafloor deformation that goes along with it. Um, so again, we've been using some of these tools to kind of produce this documentation in a way that people can view this on the web to NB Viewer and, and uh, hopefully better understand exactly how to use these tools and modify the code for their own purposes. Um, we've also tried to explain a little bit better how this mapping from the slip on the fault plane to the seafloor deformation is computed. So um, we use something called the Okada model, which is sort of a standard model that basically assumes the Earth is an elastic half space and that there's a dislocation over some small rectangle under the Earth and then it computes a Green's function solution of what's the resulting deformation of the surface that comes out of that. Um, and so we have a, a, as part of the DTOPO tools, there's an Okada function that will allow you to take a, any given slip on an arbitrary rectangle and convert it into the seafloor deformation. So this particular notebook was to explain to people how this Okada model works and what these parameters are um, that kind of describe the geometry of the fault. So there's all of these parameters, some of them are obvious, but then there's the strike, the dip, and the rake, which um, people who aren't coming from a seismology background often don't understand exactly what those mean. So this notebook was to sort of illustrate how you can set up a, a arbitrary earthquake, uh, but also explain sort of what these terms mean um, by going through some examples here. Just a little smaller. So this is um, taking a, a particular combination of parameters, strike, dip, break, depth here, uh, which are also printed in the plot, and showing the resulting seafloor deformation. So this again is sort of a top view of what this, this fault plane looks like. Um, and this is a, a slice, a vertical slice that shows that this fault plane is dipping down. So these subduction zones, you have again the oceanic plate subducting beneath the continent. So they're usually dipping down at some angle. Um, and so the dip, in this case 45 degrees, the, the scales are not equal here, so it doesn't look like 45 degrees, but that's a 45 degree uh, downward dip. Uh, the strike being zero means that this is oriented straight north, and the rake is the angle shown in green here of the slip on the fault plane relative to the strike. Um, so it's not necessarily slipping uh, purely downwards, it might be slipping at some angle. And so we have a, a set of um, sort of illustrations here of what happens if you vary any of these parameters. So for a particular choice of parameters, Applying the Sokada model gives you the resulting seafloor deformation, in this case, uh, mostly uplift. Um, and then this is just a cross section through here to show you that uh, what that uplift looks like as you move across uh, the ocean floor on one particular fixed <laughs> latitude, in this case. Um, but then you can use these uh, animation tools to sort of make it easier to explain what happens if you change one of these parameters. So for example, the strike, as I mentioned, is just the angle from north, so if you change that, all that happens is this pattern rotates around. You get exactly the same pattern, just oriented differently as you change the strike. Um, varying the dip, that again is the angle this fault plane is dipping down, so as we vary that here, we're starting with dip zero, so a horizontally oriented fault where the slip is just going parallel to the surface, and then you get uplift, it's sort of pushing the, the earth up in one direction, and spreading it out in the others, so you get one area of uplift, another of subsidence, but as you increase the dip, the pattern of where you get uplift and where you get subsidence changes. When it's exactly vertical, then it's pushing up on the right and pulling down on the left, and so you get a very different pattern of seafloor deformation. And similarly, you can vary the rake and see what happens if the angle that the slip is, is happening at varies as you go around here. Um, or finally varying the depth. 
So as we move this fault deeper and deeper, the sort of pattern of seafloor deformation spreads out more and more. The larger area is sort of affected by it, but on the other hand, you don't have quite as high a, a deformation right at the, the peak deformation. So we hope that this sort of notebook uh, not only explains how to use these tools, but also kind of explains the background much better than we could do by trying to write up a static web page. Okay, so um, let me just mention briefly, I've been working on developing some new notebooks for a little um, workshop that we're doing next week in, at University of Washington. In fact, for a number of the students, we have a big NSF grant for modeling all aspects of earthquakes and tsunamis related to this Cascadia subduction zone just off our coast. Um, and so we have a workshop to try to explore better ways to present probabilistic hazard maps. Um, so the, the sort of standard way that people present hazard maps for tsunamis often, this is a picture of Crescent City Harbor. Um, the sort of standard way is to look at something like this evacuation map for Crescent City that shows, this is the harbor, the downtown area, um, shows what regions are expected to be affected by a bad uh, tsunami that should be evacuated. But this sort of map was based on perhaps a single worst case or worst credible case kind of scenario. This is maybe the, the worst they expect with an annual probability of 1 over 2,500, 2,500 year event, something like that. Um, but there could be even worse events that flood more. There's a lot more common events that don't flood nearly as much, but still might flood parts of the city. And so we're exploring now ways of better sort of doing probabilistic analysis, trying to take some representation of probability di distribution of possible future earthquakes, not only on the Cascadia subduction zone, but also in Alaska, Japan, Chile, various other subduction zones that can create tsunamis that would affect Crescent City, uh, work with the seismologists to come up with a good way to represent that kind of probability distribution, then run a bunch of simulations through our adaptive mesh refinement code to calculate the <laughs> the inundation, and then combine those into some sort of probabilistic map. Um, but there's a lot of challenges in that. There's mathematical challenges, there's geophysical challenges, but there's also sort of social challenges uh, in terms of working with the community, with the emergency managers or the public. How do you communicate this sort of um, probabilistic analysis, even if you think you've done it right? And what sort of maps can they use in a useful way? So we're having a workshop on that in the next few days, so I've been putting together some notebooks uh, for that. Um, and so, for example, this one shows um, just a set of different tsunami uh, models for Crescent City um, and what the resulting inundation pattern is, sort of the maximum depth of flooding. So this, is, this was one particular Alaska subduction zone event, um, but as you move the slider bar, uh, it sweeps through various different events that we looked at. Some of these are very large Cascadia subduction zone events that would flood much further inland. Um, others, uh, this is from Kamchatka, uh, has relatively small impact. So by taking all of these different sort of maps and combining them with assumed probabilities of each of these events, you can come up with what are called hazard curves um, that sort of tell you for a given point, this is the red dot here shows sort of the point, for a given point, in this case out in the harbor, just look at the top curve, say the green curve, that's the shows you for a given exceedance value, a given depth of flooding, or in this case, depth above the original sea level, what's the annual probability of that happening? And this is on a logarithmic scale, so 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4, but up here at the 0.01 level, the sort of 100-year recurrence time, you can see there's already something happening here, and in this case, the slider bar allows you to move around to different points and sort of see how these hazard curves change as you uh, move to different points. And then if you're running sort of the live version of these notebooks, the students will be able to modify the probabilities perhaps and recompute these maps and also explore how can we uh, develop maybe better maps that are easier to interpret. Um, but the sort of maps we've been looking at so far are things like this, which show um, for a given um, probability value, so p equals 1 over 500, so a, sort of a 500-year uh, recurrence time or annual probability of 0.002, here's the region that we expect might flood with these depths. And again, you can use the slider bar now to see what happens as you go to uh, larger probabilities, 
1 over 100, 1 over 300, or to smaller probabilities where you can potentially get more flooding. Yeah, and finally, um, another thing I've been playing around with for this course um, is trying to help the students understand this a little bit better. Some of the students uh, that'll be uh, working with us next week on this are coming from uh, backgrounds where they maybe don't remember how you sort of combine probabilities and build up these hazard curves. So there's another notebook that sort of explains uh, how you can generate these sort of probability cur curves uh, with the exceedance on the horizontal axis and the, the corresponding probability on the vertical axis. And so one thing that um, I've been playing around with is trying to make it easier for the students to kind of check themselves as they're reading through a notebook do sort of a self-evaluation quiz. So for example, after explaining various things here, there's a little quiz down here, um, this little smaller, that says from the plot above, estimate the annual probability of exceeding 1.5 meters of flooding. So you can look at, these are actually just two different representations of the same curve, logarithmic scale versus linear scale. Uh, but if we look at 1.5 meters of flooding, we can go up here and we see that, well, that's maybe about 0.015. So the student can go in here and type in maybe, whoops, sorry, that's not correct because I typed in 0.15 instead of 0.015. Let's try 0.015. Uh, in this case, it says, oh, that's a good estimate. It was within some tolerance, uh, but it's not exactly right. And in fact, if they've understood what's going on in this notebook and look at this figure a little bit more, they should be able to find the formula to exactly compute that probability. Um, and so I encourage them to do that. Uh, and so they could maybe type in that formula here, or if they're not sure what's going on, they can just type in question mark, question mark, uh, and then it tells them what the correct answer is and how to go about computing it. So I think, uh, I'm only starting to play around with this sort of thing, but I think you know, having these kind of self-assessment quizzes in a notebook uh, can really help make sure that students are understanding things as they go through them. Okay, so um, let me go back to the slides for a minute. I can get out of this. Yeah, so this sort of self-assessment quiz is, is nice for things that you just post on the, the web or for things that you want your students to work through. But then we'd also like them to be doing homework and turning it in to be graded. Um, so I wanted to mention um, there's another project going on at Berkeley that I haven't used myself, but I plan to start using soon called NB Grader, which is specifically designed for uh, assigning notebooks, having the students do some work in the notebook, and then submit the notebook as their homework. Uh, and then certain aspects of the homework can be automatically graded if, if the answer is some numerical value that's easy to check. Um, you can put in assert statements to check that they did the homework properly. Other assignments, let's see, I think there's a picture, whoops. On the next slide, maybe. Yeah, so you can, once you've installed these uh, notebook extensions, you can, in whoops, in a particular in input cell, you can state whether it's a, an answer that should be auto-graded, uh, and then you provide some assert statements to do the grading, or whether it's a, a question that requires manual grading, like maybe you want them to write a little essay in an input cell or something, in which case um, you can then go through and read those things yourself and assign points to them. Um, so this seems like a promising way to, to work with uh, notebooks in the future. And I keep hitting the wrong button here. Um, yeah, so I, then I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of how we've been using notebooks in teaching because once you have the students all using these notebooks, especially if you want them to turn them in and be graded, then it's important that they all have sort of a common platform to be working on. Um, and I've run into problems over the years with students having a wide variety of different computer hardware and maybe, maybe not being able to install the software I want them to install. I know we all have that problem. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about a class I've, I've taught over the last few years um, where we've started using uh, notebooks, but we've also been using something called Sage Math Cloud, which is a nice cloud platform for students to work on. Um, so just a little background, this is a course that I've uh, taught several times, uh, both on campus, and we also have an online master's degree program in applied math at UW. So it's been videotaped and, and streamed for those students. And then in uh, 2013, we also turned it into a Coursera class. Uh, so we took those videotapes and, and reworked them a little bit so we could put them on Coursera. Uh, so when I was teaching that, I had about 100 and, 
uh, 20 students or so at UW, uh, 20 of them online students who weren't necessarily even in Seattle, the rest of them on campus. Uh, then again, uh, oh yeah, so we cover a bunch of things. This is only a 10-week course, so it's a very, very much an introduction to high-performance computing, but we try to teach them something about version control using Git. We have them turn in homework uh, using GitHub or Bitbucket, um, teach them something about Python, uh, but we also teach them about compiled languages, Fortran 90 in my case, uh, so we can use OpenMP and MPI and do a bit of parallel computing, how to use make files. Uh, and a lot of these students um, are coming in not even having a Linux machine, perhaps. They have a Windows machine, so we have to have some sort of common environment. And when I taught it in 2013, I guess I used virtual machines so they could download a, a virtual box machine that had all the software on it, so they had a, a uniform sort of computing environment that way. But I taught it again in 2014, and I decided to kind of flip the class, first of all, and use the, the videos that we'd made in 2013. And instead of having students come in to be lectured to again, um, we had instead lab sessions a couple times a week. Um, there's some nice rooms at UW called uh, Active Learning Classrooms, where they have, uh, the room we were using had um, nine, no, 10 of these big tables that each seat nine students, and each has a big, flat screen TV and mini dongles so that students can connect to them and then from the podium you can project what's going on at one screen to all the other tables if you want to, things like that. So it's a very nice sort of environment for the students to work together. So I was trying to have them work on programming projects in class that would kind of build on the lectures uh, and do programming in pairs and good things like that. But again, I wanted them to all have the same environment and I also wanted them to be able to collaborate easily with each other, especially when they were sitting in class and working together. Um, so, yeah, so there were these issues to deal with, and I found that a very nice solution I've been using for a lot of things now is, is the Sage Math Cloud. So, um, let me just ask, how many people are familiar with Sage Math Cloud? A few people. Um, yeah, so how many people are familiar with Sage or Sage Math, the sort of the Python package? So, William Stein, who's a number theorist at the University of Washington, started the Sage Math project uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, to sort of try to provide open source uh, packages for doing all sorts of mathematical research. Uh, and it has grown into quite a big project over the years. Uh, but then a, a few years ago, he started also this Sage Math Cloud, which is a cloud platform for, for running Sage, but also for running Python more generally, and also for doing pretty much anything you can do on a Linux machine. So anybody can create a, a free account at cloud.sagemath.com. Um, he's actually just this year uh, gone outside of the University of Washington and started a, a company so that um, they can actually charge people if they want to do larger scale computing. So it's all run under the, the hood by Google Cloud. It's running on Google Cloud. And so if you want to buy like a 32 core instance for doing a bigger computation, uh, you can now go through Sage Math Cloud and, and buy more computing time. Or if you're teaching a huge class of thousands of calculus students or something, then if they each pay a little bit each semester, they get maybe some additional tools. Um, but there's still free accounts available, um, which you can use, you can use in teaching classes. Um, William gave a nice uh, presentation on this in our, our reproducibility and open science seminar in March, uh, which is online if you're interested in, in seeing more of a demo of it. Um, but it's useful for lots of things. Uh, so I'm not gonna try to do a live demo here, but I, I just have a few screenshots of the sort of things that you can do with it. So if you create an account, then you get a list of projects, which would be empty initially, but you can click on uh, create new project and make a new one. Each project is basically a Linux virtual machine. Um, and so you can see I have quite a few projects. Some of them are associated with classes I've taught. Some of them are associated with Clawpack or GeoClaw tutorials, things like that. Um, but each project you know, stays around forever. You can open it whenever you want. Go back to what you were doing on that virtual machine, basically. Um, so if you click on one of these projects, in this case, AMAF 583 Labs, uh, and then on files, you get a list of the files that are associated with it, but it's really just, a, as I said, a Linux box. Some of these files are, have the extension .term. Those are just terminals that I created. If I click on one of those, what I get is just a Linux terminal, and you can have more than one terminal open at a time. Each time you open a new, a new file, it just opens a new tab up here. Um, <coughs> And so if I do ls in the terminal window, I get basically the same set of files we were seeing in a minute ago. And you'll notice there's some uh, IPython notebooks, some Sage worksheets, various other things here. Um, 
Yeah, so in the class, as I mentioned, we were also teaching them to use G-Fortran and OpenMP, so this was just uh, illustrating that they can, uh, you know, run G-Fortran, run the code. In this case, uh, they each had, I think, a sort of a quad-core instance running so they could actually be trying out different ways of parallelization, and I knew that all the students had the same computing environment, basically. Um, there's also a, a nice uh, text editor. Of course, you can use Vim or other editors, but there's also a nice sort of built-in text editor that, that's very simple for the students to use. Um, there's also a nice WYSIWYG LaTeX editor, so if you want them to start using LaTeX, you open a LaTeX file, it opens it in this form by default, where you have the LaTeX, and then it in real time sort of uh, typesets it for you. Um, it's also very collaborative in the sense that if I, it's, yeah, if I uh, make someone else a collaborator on one of my projects, then they can access that. It shows up in their list of projects as well. And then if they go to the same project URL, um, they can open any of the files. We can both have the same file open at the same time, and it works like Google Docs. I can be typing something, and it's updating in real time on their screen, vice versa. Um, I found this very useful when I was teaching this online course, because I had students who weren't even in Seattle who were running into problems trying to run a code. Uh, they couldn't just bring their laptop into my office, but they could call me up on the phone and say, take a look at this. I could open up their project. I could watch what they were typing. I could see what was going on. I could go in and change a file if I wanted to. Um, so for teaching, I found that a, a very useful tool. Yeah, and so if you click on the new button up at the top, then um, you can create various things, including like Jupyter Notebooks or Sage Worksheets, LaTeX documents, new terminals and whatnot, or it's very easy to upload things um, from your computer. Uh, there's also this Manage a Course button up here. Uh, one thing they've been putting a lot of work into recently is, is developing better tools to make it easy to teach with this platform. Um, so the class I was teaching, for example, um, if you click on the, the, uh, the um, where is it, the settings button, I guess it is, then you get the list of collaborators and you can add new collaborators. So for this particular class, I had two TAs that were collaborating on this particular notebook. But for all of the students, I had them make me a collaborator on their project if they wanted me to be able to come in and take a look at what they were doing and help them out. Uh, but this new sort of courseware that they're working on makes that even easier because you can create, if you go back here, where was it, um, to manage a course. If you click on manage a course, then I could set this project up as a course um, and then you can select uh, folders or directories that you want to share with all of the students in the class. So you can add as many students as you want uh, and then for each of the directories that you've added here, they show up in a list where you can if you click on the Assign button, you can either assign it to all the students or selectively to some of them. What that does is that it, it copies that directory to all of their projects. So if you have a homework notebook that you want to distribute, you can distribute that easily to all of the students. Uh, then they can work the notebook, put in their answers, and then you can collect, click on the Collect All button, and it gathers all of those up and brings them back to your project in separate directories for each student. You can go through and grade them, and then click on Return Graded, and it sends it back out to the students again. So this is an, a nice tool, I think. Um, I haven't used it in the class yet, but I'll be using it next week in this workshop that we're running on. Looks like it's gonna work very well for us. Um, okay, so let me uh, stop there. I think about out of time, but here's a few uh, references, again, if you're interested in, in pursuing any of these things further. Um, we do have, I do have some examples online. I'm hoping to get more examples of the sort of things we're doing up there. There's also a, a whole bunch of interesting uh, IPython notebooks, Jupyter notebooks, at this link here. If you haven't discovered that before, it's worth taking a look at. So I will stop there and ask for questions. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the great presentation. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, okay, let's start there. Hi, um, thanks for the talk, it was really interesting. Um, you mentioned a bit about the kind of software development skills and open source development skills that you sort of were implicitly teaching. How important do you feel that is in terms of what you're giving students, you know, f who want to leave academia, like, how, you know, could you comment a little bit on 
that which I think is part of your institution's kind of uh, um, aims, if I'm correct. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's very important to teach students software, good software programming practices. And certainly in, in most of my classes now, I try to teach version control in particular because that seems to be something that, in my opinion, everyone should use for almost everything. And, and yet many people don't use and still find uh, they think it's too intimidating to get started with. But in fact, it's, it's relatively easy now with all the great resources and whatnot. So I try to use use Git and GitHub now in most of the classes that I teach. Um, one thing I, I mentioned about that, I, you know, I mentioned in, in this class, the high performance computing class, I had them submitting homework using Git. Um, and then I taught another class this last year where I also had them doing that. It was my course on, on finite value methods for hyperbolic problems. Um, and they were submitting homework with Git and they were, some of them were struggling a bit to understand why this was um, better than just submitting it through the online submission system that's already set up at UW, for example. But then later in the quarter, I had them working on group projects, and they had to work together on writing some code, they had to write a joint report, they had to make slides for a presentation, uh, and then they started collaborating uh, using GitHub, and I had a you know, separate GitHub account for each of the, the groups that was collaborating. And then they really started realizing the, the value of it. So of course, I should have realized that earlier, but I think if you, if you want to, to encourage them to start using uh, GitHub and some of those sorts of techniques, it's really important to have them doing collaborative things where they see the value of, of really being able to use these tools. Um, yeah, and in general, I, mean, I think uh, we need to put more emphasis on sort of programming software engineering skills. Also, I didn't say too much about reproducibility, but that's something else that I try to stress in my classes. Um, and the notebook, I think, is a great platform for, well, maybe for literate programming is a better term than reproducibility in this case, in the sense that, that Knuth, I think, coined that term long ago, is you should really write computer programs to be human readable, not just machine readable, and you should somehow incorporate documentation right with the code. And there have been, of course, many systems for doing that, the Sweeve system that he was working on, and Doxygen, and other things over the years. But I think something like the notebook, at least for relatively small code fragments makes it so much easier to do literate programming and to really explain what you're doing in a way that you can figure out later on and that other people who are looking at can, and it makes it much more fun and interactive as well. So I think that's, that's one of the main values of this. And you know, people sometimes ask, well, is it gonna be reproducible if I do it in the notebook? Because the notebook keeps changing all the time and maybe the, the plotting packages keep changing and Sage Math Cloud, they keep updating the, the version of Linux or whatever, how do you know it's gonna run in the future? And, but to me, I think reproducibility is, is not so much necessarily about making sure the code always runs forever, but just making the code available so that humans can look at the code and see what was actually done. Because so many papers that implement algorithms and present results, there's so many implementation details that don't make it into the paper, but that are essential in really understanding what was going on. And if you want to compare different methods down the road, it's really important to archive the code. Um, even if it doesn't run in the future, it's still hopefully readable. And, Again, the notebooks make that much easier. So that's kind of another thing that I certainly stress in, in classes that, that I think students appreciate getting exposed to. Okay, there are a few more questions. <laughs> Thank you for the great talk. Um, programming within the notebook and uh, writing modules uh, or building packages are two quite different ways of programming. And I was wondering whether you had some teaching experience where you had to teach both modes of programming to students. And if you could, if yes, if you could comment on how well people can switch to one mode to the other. Between writing in a notebook versus writing exactly. a module that you yeah. import, uh -huh. for example. Yeah. Um, so I guess I don't have a lot of experience with teaching that, but it's certainly something I've struggled with a bit in terms of presenting things in notebook. How much of the code do you want in the notebook? And how much do you want the student to be able to just kind of read the, the mathematics and then see the examples and not have to see pages and pages of, of code that isn't really relevant? So some of the notebooks I, I showed like that one where you could move the, the states around in the, the phase plane. Maurizio's original version of that, all the code was there and there was you know, lots of JavaScript right there in the, the IPython notebook and it was a little hard to kind of navigate through. So we put that in a module and then we just import that module. But 
then it's useful if, if you also sort of distribute that module and maybe even have a link in the notebook so that the student can easily click on that link and open up the page that shows them the module so that the code is, is still there behind the scenes um, and they can go and look at it if they want to, but it doesn't get in the way of what you're trying to explain. So I try to kind of find the right balance between what, what needs to be done that's best hidden away and what is really the essential bits of the code that you want the students to see along with the figures that it produces so that they really understand what's being plotted, for example. I have a very similar question about the version control. So if you have a notebook, how do you really version control? There are two things like this, the numbers of this changing, and also if you, if you have, like, if you generate all those, those graphics, they put the graphics as binary in there. How, right. do, how, do, you, how do you manage this? I, have, I haven't really managed this yet. How do you manage? Yeah, so um, I use NB strip out, which is just a little utility. I think Min wrote at Berkeley that, that just, you can run it on a notebook and it strips out all of the numbers and all of the output and saves it in a form that, that doesn't change if all you're doing is running, rerunning the notebook, for example. Um, and so when the version I check into my Git repository is after I've run NB strip out. Um, and I think you can also put it in as a, a, a Git hook so that that automatically happens. Like, 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 so like that what we're versioning is really just the, the input cells and then um, what we post for people to look at is after having executed it. Um, and there's also a way with uh, um, NB convert to sort of run a, run a notebook and, and save the output without having to actually open it and run it and, and save it from the, from the web too. So I'm sure for the remaining question, there's still the coffee break and I'm sure you can approach. Be happy Mr. to, thank you. The back then.